Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast, episode number 27. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I've started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talents. The podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests, all thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way, come to this show to debate, discuss and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. One size doesn't fit all. What Airbnb or Google do around the employee experience may not be applicable in a smaller company. This is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that the EX doesn't require a large team or a large budget, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Matt Morgan, speaking with me from the Bay Area. Matt is the former VP of Employee Experience and and Development at Pandora and the current Head of People at Blend. Blend is a tech startup that is transforming the consumer lending experience. Today with Matt, we will talk about how a company's purpose, or the now famous Simon Sinek's why, is a key driver in talent acquisition, employee retention, and engagement. How Blend has scaled up its culture during its rapid growth over the past five years. What is the place of technology in the employee experience? And how perks are a reflection of a company's values, although perks don't define the culture itself. This week's EX podcast is sponsored by Structural. Structural unleashes the potential of people and teams by giving organizations real-time mobile access to employee data. Find, engage, and retain talent with a Structural employee success platform. EX podcast listeners can visit structural.com slash EX podcast to get access to the latest employee experience resources including the Employee Success Playbook featuring 10 research-backed methods to improve business outcomes. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Matt today. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes. You can open the iTunes app and type in Stefan Vincent or EX Podcast and you will find us there. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions or ideas for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. Thanks for your support and your loyalty. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the EX Podcast. Today's guest is Matt Morgan. Matt is the head of people at Blends, a startup based in San Francisco with about 200 employees. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. For those who don't know you, tell us a bit more about your background, your current role at Blends, and what Blend does. Sure. So, uh, to start with Blend, Blend uh, is a software as a service company that uh, we provide technology to help banks simplify, and really any financial institution simplify and make uh, right now the mortgage application process uh, more simple and more transparent. Um, but our our future vision is really about doing that across the consumer finance uh, ecosystem and really making that entire industry, which is, you know, uh, $42 trillion industry. And we, uh, it's it's been not really paid attention to from Silicon Valley. And so we have been uh, working for the last five years in partnership with the consumer finance industry to really improve what they do for customers uh, and bring to bear some some special capability that we have around 
process simplification, design, and just really, really great engineering. So I've, I've been here for uh, a little over a year. Um, my background is that I, I spent 10 years as a recruiter um, and, you know, helping both on the East Coast and the West Coast, helping companies scale up. And then for the last 10 years, I've been working on the uh, broader HR side of the, of the business and uh, spent time at uh, Nielsen, a multinational, um, then went to Pandora and I was there for almost five years. And then I uh, joined Blend. And, uh, last September. Okay, um, so what what do you focus on in your role as head of people at Blend? Yeah, sure. So I'm really focused. Uh, my team is entirely focused on three basic things, which is attracting, retaining, and driving the productivity of our employees. And so it's you know traditionally a, a traditional HR team, but I also look after our facilities and environment, um, as well as internal communications um, and, and things like that. Okay. So when you think about the why a company is in business, its purpose or its mission, Blend was founded on a very on very clear principles, and you yeah. alluded to them a bit earlier. But can you expand a bit on this and how this clear purpose is a key driver in the talent acquisition, employer retention, and engagement? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, listen, every company, especially here in kind of Silicon Valley, you know wants to talk about how they're saving the world. And there's, there's lots of companies uh, that are doing really, really great things. I think that's one of the really exciting things about working here at, at this time. Um, but the truth is the, the impact that, you know, we have when we think about uh, what it is, our, our ability to help people to get access to capital, to make that capital uh, less expensive, uh, and to um, make it so that it's also less biased um, is something that we feel is a really, really big deal. And I think, you know, all of this becomes a big deal because what employees seek today is really purpose. And so, you know, when we're talking about what they would work on here versus what they might work on at, a, at a, another company, um, we're really able to talk to them about the impact that their work will have. And that's both a function of our size. So we're still pretty small, so their relative impact is, is pretty large. Um, but then beyond that, I think we're, we're able to uh, really help them um, understand that this work is truly impactful to the people around them and changes how some pretty fundamental things in our culture get done. So buying a house, buying a car, paying off your student loan, getting you know insurance, all of those things are all things that will be helping to make more simple and more transparent. And I think you know for today's uh, worker, that becomes a really, really big deal. It is a big deal. I mean, those those are very important steps in someone's life. At the same time, especially the lending and mortgage industry has a bad reputation since the financial crisis. Yeah. So how do you how do you build a culture of trust within the organization? Knowing that some of your employees have to maybe address some of the um, perception challenges from the outside. Yeah, I mean, I think that our our approach is, uh, you know, a lot of companies again the kind of trope in the valley is to talk about disruption, right? Like we're disrupting, we're disrupting, we're disrupting. And we really have been in partnership with this industry. This is, you know, like I said before, this consumer lending overall is a 42 trillion with a T dollar business in the United States and completely ignored by Silicon Valley and technologists. So somebody has to get in there to fix this. And these companies have these enormous systems that they've invested lots of time and money in, and they can't just wholesale 
rip them out and then put something new in, it needs to be a partnership over time. And so we really, you know, I think our pitch to people who feel like, wow, you're helping all these big companies. These big companies are not going away. And, you know, the, all of these companies that are trying to disintermediate, you know, banks and other financial institutions, they may be successful on the margins, but I think it's pretty unlikely that, you know, uh, a Wells Fargo or a Bank of America or these really big institutions are truly going to go away. So our best bet is to then work within the system and to help them to get better and provide them with expertise that they don't have to help them get better. And, you know, one of our principles, we're very principles-based organizations that, you know, sometimes we will take the road less traveled, even if it is harder. And I think that our relationship with banks is kind of example number one of that, in that we are really willing to work with them and to help them achieve their goals. And if we make them successful, we feel like we can be uh, wildly successful as a provider to them. Okay, so even though you've been at Blend for about a year or so, um, you know, the company was founded in 2012 mm-hmm. and has seen an incredible growth in five years leading to 2017. Uh, even though you've been there for a year, how do you have a, some sort of um, insights on how it's been to scale up the culture? Yeah. Just five years. Well, I mean, I think that you know the 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 company um, has doubled in size every year. Uh, I think they the company has had a very big focus on its people, um, and for a long time, well before my arrival here, uh, the company treated its employees really, really well, and and the. And so I think, you know, that was the first thing is to not just do, you know, there's, we talk about, you know, perks and other stuff. And I know we're going to talk about that later. All of that stuff was really designed. It was done here very early and was really designed around making this a place that you want to come to work every day uh, and making it an easy place to come to work. You know, I think it's, we know that, you know, there's nobody who, quits their job because the snacks are bad, right? Like that just doesn't happen. Um, Our intention is to just make things easier. And so I think a really clear purpose, uh, a a really clear vision of what it was that we were trying to do, and then a real bottoms-up approach. So this is a company that has never been top-down, dictatorial. It's a uh, you know, very um, employee-led culture. And I think when you have an employee-led culture that really creates uh, great power and, and is very enticing to the right types of employees. And so we've, you know, we get our fair share of recruits. We're able to hire really well, and we have really, really great retention over the last five years. How do you identify what are the things that make people want to join blends or stay with blends? Um, and how do you build the culture around it? Like, do yeah. you guys do you guys do employee journey map? Do you do some type of deep research on to find the uh, employee drivers around the employee experience and culture? Right. Yeah, we we've uh, we've done bits and pieces of that work. So we we when I arrived, one of the first things we did was to we we had kind of a semblance of a purpose, and there were there were norms in the culture that already existed like around, you know, things like taking the road less traveled and iteration and and things like that, that are really important to us. So the first thing we did was really just to document those. And Mm -hmm. now we do use those as a way to evaluate candidates and things like that. But at the end of the day, I, I, like there, I, I totally get it. And I think there's all sorts of great science that you can, um, that you can put against things like this, but the, the best people are going to spend time with some of our best people. And we're going to be able to identify whether they're people that you want to come to work with every day and who can help you to achieve your overall goal. And so although, you know,
know, we, we can spend lots of time and we, and we will continually refine to make sure that we're broadening our scope, that we're, you know, getting the right mix of diversity and, and things like that. Um, but I, uh, you know, at, at the core of it, it's about when you're talking to people about a job is, you know, getting really good people in the room, having them really care about who joins their team and then really making great decisions based on, you know, kind of merit and, uh, and capability to expand our culture and make our culture better. And so I, I think that, um, that kind of, uh, ripple effect mm -hmm. is really, really powerful. And I think, you know, and I think that's pretty typical for companies of our size as we scale now, it gets harder. And so we are doing things like turning, our principles into an interview and, you know, things like that. Um, but I, you know, for most of our, of our history, I think it's that ripple effect of, you know, making sure that our best people are, are in front of candidates. Yeah. How, how do you, what, what the interview process looks like at Blends? Is it something that is very structured? Is it something that is totally unstructured? What yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, on the engineering side, it's it's extremely structured, um, and, and frankly, we we probably uh, would like it to be even more structured. Um, in other parts of the business, it's a little bit less so. Uh, we have another one of our really uh, important principles is to push decisions to where they make sense, right? To where the people who are making that decision have as much information as possible and, and, and the capability to make it. And so for that reason, we, we do, you know, managers are responsible for designing their interview process and things like that. Um, in the areas where we're doing bulk hiring, like in sales or in engineering, where we're, you know, just the numbers are really big. We try to get a little bit more refined, um, but uh, we, we definitely want managers to be responsible for building the process that makes sense for their evaluation. So for, well, you, you've, you are in the, obviously the SaaS, um, SaaS world. Um, for me, the employee experience is defined by three key elements, the culture, the technology, and the office space. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the technology because that's the, the world where a blend lives in. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, before we dive into that, just for one second, I, I do think that um, there's one thing missing there, and, and maybe you get to it with kind of technology, but I actually think that um, process is just a huge part of what creates the employee experience. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, every day we ask employees to come to work, and we ask them in some manner to jump through some sort of hoop to do some sort of thing, whether that's, you know, they want to, they need to order a new screen for their computer. They need to, you know, get their computer fixed. They need to, um, you know, they want to go take a class. They want to go, you know, whatever these, and that's like all kind of in the procurement side, I, I would say on the, you know, there's also all these processes that we think about in terms of performance and, and development and, and things like that. And so when processes are, when internal processes or even just, you know, my previous, um, life when I was at Pandora where you know, it's a huge ad serving business, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that drove our client service people, the people who are actually, you know, taking ads from customers, making sure that they were ready for the, for the service and getting them, you know, building the campaign and then putting them up their internal technology, the use of their internal technology, the processes that they had to go through to actually get their job done. It was the thing that drove them the craziest. I could give them the worst manager. Huh. I could give them, right. I could make them work in a room with no windows. Like all that wouldn't matter if they felt like it's easy to get my job done mm -hmm. and the, those processes. And so I, you know, I, I really think part of um, one of the things that Nielsen really instilled, instilled in me as a young HR guy was that one of our big responsibilities is around killing 
kind of bad process. And so I definitely try to, you know, so as I looked at your, your question and kind of thought about those three areas, and I agree that I think those are key. It, I've always felt like, you know, process improvement overall um, across the organization is just another really important thing. It, it's a very good point because it, it's you know, making sure that the processes don't overkill the the empowerment of the employees to do the work and do it well and in an engaging way. The you know I, I heard a uh, an interview of the head of the employee experience at Airbnb, yeah. and he was saying yeah. that uh, basically he defined a framework around the culture and the employee experience. So there are some boundaries, but within that framework, there's pretty much freedom for employees to def- and teams to define what their subculture or what their own employee experience is about. So th- yeah. there's, there's a bit of processes to put in place in some framework so that people don't go crazy anywhere, but there's also some sort of freedom and That's empowerment right. to bid in that. So how, how do you manage both so that it's, um, you know, th- there's some guidelines, but there's some freedom within, within those guidelines? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I think expense reports are always a great example of that. <laughs> but I thought one of, like, the best things that Nielsen ever did is, you know, it used to be that you would do the normal thing where your manager would review your expense report, but they found when they looked at the data that, like, 1% of... Uh, forms were kicked back, right? And so they said, well, why are we having managers approve this? They're either everybody is doing it perfectly or they're just not paying attention. Right. So what's, what's the value, right? And, you know, I think Patty McCord from Netflix talks about that a lot. You know, when she was having to really restructure that business, like anybody whose job is to approve something from somebody else, we're, we're getting rid of that job. We don't need that job. And so in Nielsen, they got rid of, you know, approval of expense reports and they just hired a bunch of accountants in India to go in and look at expense reports. And if they saw something weird, they would then flag that and somebody could go follow up. But it reduced this friction. It reduced this step, right? And um, so I just, I kind of always have taken that mindset. And we just, you know, like there doesn't need to be an approval on every single thing. And, um, and, you know, there are these overarching processes that we can simplify. Now, what you were talking about was, like, how do you let teams do their own thing? And I have to say that's one where, um, you know, I think HR people have to fight against our, like, kind of Pavlovian training, <laughs> which is that, which is that like, all must be equal for all, uh-huh. right? Everybody must do the same thing. And, you know, that's just not likely to be successful. And I, I mean, I struggle with this because I feel like my job is to create this kind of unified employee experience. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, but, and, but so I, I have to constantly kind of catch myself and catch my team and have my team, my team catch me and say, well, like, do we really need to say that this is how this team should do this? Or can we just let them decide that? Why are we thinking that we have to do that work? And so I think it's, you know, it's just a constant, you have to, keep checking back with yourself and, and really coming back to kind of, you know, first principles of like, what do you believe in? Yeah. And if as long as we're aligned on what we believe in, then you should be allowed to, you know, make that what it is for you. And it's a very tough balance to, to find because no, no, my perspective on the podcast is really to, to see what principles and what ideas and insights companies can apply from a brand's marketing customer experience side to the employee side, right? So when you think of marketers or customer experience professionals who try to apply some of the same principles where humans, whether employees or consumers, are empowered to define what their own experiences are, on the same same side, oh, on the other side, sorry, the HR people traditionally have been trained so that HR's role is to police and to protect the organization right. itself. So right. somehow or, those or, are or the cops, which is like, I mean, can you think of a worse job? Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, and I think that's the thing. I think, yeah, we, we have to be the ultimate backstop of, mm-hmm. okay. You know, somebody has got to make a call about, you know, 
an employee did something that's maybe on the margins, you know, how do we want to handle that? Right. And we do have to be there, but with, but beyond that, I, I think, you know, the, the truth is, is that there's not the amount of risk that a company is taking on with some of this stuff is pretty low. And so HR's involvement is probably overkill a lot of the time. Oh yeah, I agree. And I, I would I would make the parallel. I I worked for um, a large pharmaceutical company uh, on the agency side, but oftentimes when I worked with the brand teams, we were like, oh yeah, we should do this, we should do this, and then we would al- always get a no from a regulatory or from a legal or compliance. No, we can't do that. Well, we can. Well, we can do that. Can we find a way and how we can make it work? It's kind of the same in some organizations. I don't want to bash HR at all, but in yeah. some organizations where the HR function is so traditional, that it's always a no when you try to bring ideas forward. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're trained to, to mitigate risk and new, new, the new is often, you know, is almost defined as more risky than the status quo. It is. Yeah. Well, let, let's go back on, on the question on technology then. Because yeah, yeah. you, so obviously you empower your customers to use technology to enhance and better the experience to... Um, you know, get a mortgage, uh, get a loan, things of that nature. So wh- when you look at how consumers are very more and more savvy when it comes to technology, but they also expect a seamless experience when they use technology platforms. But okay. oftentimes it becomes more complicated when those same consumers are within an organization at work and they have to face with no, not so much seamless experiences with technology. So how can you, how do you guys you know, blend that, not making a pun, but blend those two experiences so that it's seamless on both sides? Um, for, our, for our customers or for our employees? Well, so basically, because for, from how do you make sure that the, whatever works well on the customer side is applicable as well on the employee side so that your employees have a seamless experience when it comes to using technology. Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, you know, our system is effectively the CRM, you know, we're effectively Salesforce for, uh, uh, for, you know, consumer finance professionals, right, and mm-hmm. in a lot of the work that we do. And so, you know, our approach, we, we have spent uh, a ton of time actually on the borrower side, making sure that from a consumer perspective, it's really a really great experience. We've actually spent less time on the lender side, um, but we're we're now really starting to build that out. We, we launched this year a uh, uh, you know, mobile application that lender lenders can use to, you know, keep track of their business. And so we're really starting to kind of integrate ourselves into their work and their environment. And I think, you know, it's the same way that we think about technology for our own team. And, and when we think about our own team, we want to enable people to do the things they need to do when they need to do it. So like, you know, for instance, you think about, um, you know, there's, there's these moments in the day where you have a little bit of downtime. And so we deliver lots of information via Slack to employees. And we use that mechanism because it's where they're already going to go and they're going to browse through and they're going to spend time there. And so if we put something there. We know that even if it's at eight o'clock at night and they're at the grocery store, but they're standing in line, they're going to be able to get the information that they need. So we really try to put information in front of them um, to give them context to do their jobs when they need it. Oh, okay. All right. That that's uh, that's good insight. When so the, the the way I found about I found out about a blend was an article uh, about unique perks in startups. And for instance, a blend offers four months of parental leave if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Correct. So or, or if they're taking care of a ill family member or, or things like that. So we often hear that a company's culture is not defined by perks, and I do agree with that. However, 
perks are still important. And why yeah, is that so? I, I mean, I guess I would say I, I think that you know benefits are a manifestation of what we believe in, mm -hmm. right? And so for us, what we believe in is a highly diverse and inclusive work environment that um, enables everybody to come in and do their best work. And so as we looked at, you know, our practice, because like you're right, I, you know, like I said before, I don't think people leave a job because the snacks are no good. I think, you know, they leave a job because they're misaligned to the principles of the company. They don't work well with their manager. They don't think that they can develop or get ahead or frankly, just because it's time and they want to go do something else, which, you know, when I meet with new employees every month at our onboarding session, um, I talk to them about their next job after blend because I'm actually really, I think that the best compensation that we give is the development that people get while they're here. This place is a rocket ship. We're growing like crazy. And so for us and for, for people who come to work for us here, they're really learning every day about how to build a business. We all are. And, and there's nobody there telling them exactly what to do. And so we help them to grow and develop and, and build a better resume. And that's really the, the best thing that we do for them. So I think that, you know, our benefits are designed to help support people to fulfill that promise. And so when we looked at leave, you know, we believe that everybody um, we believe that everybody can be, uh, can, can have career defining experience at blend. Uh, and our, what we want to do is make sure that we retain them, that, that we give them every reason to come back, right? Cause every morning, every employee has a choice about whether to come back to work. And so the, the less reason we can give them to make a choice to go do something else for as long as possible. So that's, you know, that is things like leave. And then, you know, I think part of what we still have to do uh, on the edges of that is we need to bring, uh, we need to make it easier to go out on leave. So like how are, what's the off ramp like? Uh, and then we need to make it easier to come back from leave. So what's the on ramp like? Mm. And how do we make those both really great experiences for people so that then we can get them productive when they're back and we can get them to develop. And so then, you know, we also have this really big focus on development. Our entire performance practice is a hundred percent forward looking and about future development. How do we help people get better? And so if we, so we need to keep them for as long as we can, and then we need to develop them and give them a ton of opportunity to move around and try new things. And then, uh, and once we've done that, then we, we, we will, and we already are, we're starting to win that war for talent because you can go lots of places and make a bunch of money. Um, but you can't go a lot of places that are truly going to have a focus on developing you. And so, we, you know, we, I, I have a, this is a very small company. I have two L and D people and we're continuing to invest in that area. And we're focused on building out practices and, 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 uh, just in time training and development opportunities to really help people achieve kind of their full potential. Um, and so for us, like when we think about perks and we think about like our benefits, it starts with development. It's the number one piece of compensation will give any employee a plan. No, what you just said is very interesting about sort of a candid understanding, not an expectation, but a candid understanding that's yeah, you may not stand for the entire career at Blend, and we totally understand it, but we want to make sure that during that time, you actually build your resume and you gain experience so that you, you sort of graduate from Blanche right. as a better person and a more seasoned professional. Which right. is and, and with, with really marketable skills. And guess what? That's self-reinforcing. 
the more we do that, the more it gets back to college campuses, the more, I mean, you know, this is how all of these big academy companies have made that work. You think about, you know, McKinsey and GE and Procter and Gamble and, you know, uh, Pepsi and, and companies like that, like those are, those are the companies that I look up to. And I think, you know, I, I don't think that Silicon Valley's done a great job about that. I think we're really good at buying talent. I think we are less good at developing talent. I agree with you. And, you know, th- there's a higher understanding of the importance now on the, how do you nurture your talent pool of candidates, you know, uh, but not so much emphasis on the sort of the alumni network. There's still, you know, employer referrals. You know, in, uh-huh. current employees get a bonus when they refer someone uh-huh. to the company, but not so much for the, actually, the employees who actually left the company and they may refer someone down the roads to the company that they left. So I think that's the back ends of once the, comp- once the employee leaves the company, nothing matters anymore the relationship right. ends totally i think there's a there's a part that is missed for for from companies there yeah no i agree and i i think you know building a really great alumni network um and you know really making sure that we continue to uh cultivate that alumni network and, and make sure that those people continue to feel connected to blend and you know uh is is i think a, a really important step and, and we're we're certainly not there yet uh, but I, I do agree i think it's a really important part how do you see again ma- making the parallel between the customer and the employee experience mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of segmentation on the customer side, we make sure that we have different types of products or services to address the needs of different market segments. Uh, yep. we, you know, pr- we provide a more personalized communication and experience to the customers. Do you see that some, some time in the future we'll go to a more personalized employee experience where they may have different benefit packages depending on the different employee groups? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we already do that in a way. I mean, I, I think we, we have very specific strategies um, for our kind of org leaders, if you will. So kind of people who are managing functions or sub-functions. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have very clear strategies around development for people managers, so line managers, right, which, you know, we know really have a huge impact on the employee experience and on uh, people's um, overall happiness and and health in the company. And then we have, you know, we have strategies for individual contributors. And then I think you're right. I think like beyond that, the personas that you're probably creating are, are sort of like, uh, there's a technical persona. There's kind of a non-technical persona. There's a high potential, you know, kind of, um, wants to accelerate really fast persona. And I think, you know, we have to be ready to meet all those people. Um, right now, I would say, you know, given our size, that's really a kind of more just a, a person to person experience. You know, mm-hmm. how do I meet so-and-so where they are and help them and know what their background is? And, and we can do that. I think as we scale, it's, it's building up more systematic approaches to, uh, uh, to, to that kind of work. If you were to invite a, a historical figure to dinner, yeah. who would you invite and why? Yeah, I, uh, I think I, I would actually invite Stanley Kubrick. Uh, so mm. I uh, always uh, have had uh, a really big interest in film. I was a media studies and cinema minor and, and American studies major in college. And I write screenplays on the side. And, um, you know, I think he's, he's likely the, the greatest filmmaker who ever lived. And, um, just to, you know, I would love to spend an hour talking about the creation of the, you know, the cut that jumps to millennia in, in, 2001 a space odyssey right where they throw up the bone and then it cuts to the uh you know the same image but basically now it's a space city space station you know it's a 2000 year cut things like that um just are sort of fascinating to me what is your favorite movie by the way of stanley kubrick um that's tough i 
probably uh, uh, The Killing, which um, is uh, Sterling Hayden. He made it, uh, it's other, it would either be The Killing or Paths of Glory, both of which were back to back in the mid to late 50s, maybe early 60s, but I think mid to late, late 50s. Um, and The Killing is a, a heist movie. Uh, and it's just, just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful film. Really, really well done. Uh, then Paths of Glory, you know, is just one of the most traumatic war movies I've ever seen. And uh, it's, uh, just really, um, uh, striking. So, I mean, I like it all. I like everything he's ever made, but those two are ones that, uh, I really, really enjoy. Okay, so you, the, you technology guy, how many apps do you have on your phone? Any idea? Uh, I, I think I probably have like 100 apps on my phone. I probably use 25 of them on a regular basis. But uh, yeah, I have way more than I need, that's for sure. What is the one that you use the most? Um, it's either Slack or Facebook. So, okay. you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, those would probably be the two that I'm on the most. What is the essential item that you always take with you when you go on vacation? Books. I don't, I don't read nearly as much as I would like to. And so anytime I'm on vacation, I, I take the opportunity and I usually am able, depending on the amount of time we have, able to power through one, if not two or three books. Are you more of a paper book or ebook? Paper. Paper. Can't can't get into the ebook thing. Uh, I, I've tried and uh, I just I can't do it. So I, I I still buy and I actually still buy a lot of hardcover books uh, on because I, I get impatient to wait for paperback. And there's something that is about the smell of books that you can get from an ebook. That's for sure. Absolutely, I would agree with you on this and just the tactile aspect of it as well. Yeah, um, and so you're based in San Francisco, so I'm, I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, favorite places to eat. What, what is your favorite food? Any any type of curry doesn't really matter what kind, but Indian curry, Thai curry, Vietnamese curry, uh, you know, Cambodian, Burmese, any, any kind doesn't matter. I I just I'll eat curry every day of the week. And what what uh, side of the scale are you on? Very spicy or very, very spicy? Very spicy. Yeah, I have, I have to order by myself because <laughs> I, I have I have uh, I'm married and I have four children, and none of them like it as uh, as spicy as I do. Okay, all right. Well, what is the way for our listeners to follow you and Blend on social media? Yeah, we, uh, you can find us at Blend Labs Inc. on Twitter or um, look for us on, on Facebook or uh, we, we, do, we definitely spend uh, a lot of time on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn, um, all of which you can find. Uh, our, our official company name is Blend Labs. Uh, we go by Blend, um, but for some of our older uh, uh, handles, we still have the, the Blend Labs uh, moniker. Okay, and on LinkedIn, it's just blend. It is Correct. just blend on LinkedIn, yes. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Matt, I appreciate it. Yes, thanks for having me. This has been great. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.